Hello, everyone. Um, can everyone hear us okay? I am here to introduce Laura Keim, today's speaker. Uh, but first, I just want to go over how the webinar is going to work. So you should have a chat option and a Q&A option. So if you have questions throughout the program, you can type us your questions and we will get back to them at the end. So Laura Keim, in addition to her work as Denton's curator, is a lecturer in the graduate program in historic preservation at the University of Pennsylvania. She also serves as curatorial advisor to Historic Germantown, the consortium of 18 sites in Northwestern Philadelphia. Laura holds an MS from the Penn Preservation Program, an MA in Early American Culture from the University of Delaware's Winnature Program, and an AB in Art History from Smith College. She has published a Stenton guidebook, an exhibition catalog, Logania Stenton Collections Reassembled, and articles in the magazine Antiques, Antiques and Fine Art, and Ceramics in America. Her primary research interests include architecture, the decorative arts, and material culture of the British and North American Atlantic world in the 18th and early 19th centuries, as well as the history of collecting and reinvention of the past in England and America in the 20th century. Her recent publications include Why Do Furnishings Matter? The Power of Furnishings in Historic House Museums, a chapter in Reimagining Historic House Museums, New Approaches and Proven Solutions, and Remembering the Olden Time, John Fanning Watson's Cultivation of Memory and Relics in Early National Philadelphia. In a Material World, Culture, Society, and the Life of Things in Early Anglo-America, edited by George B. Drew and Margaret Markle Lowell, both released in 2019. Today, Laura will present On the Plantation, expanding our knowledge of enslaved and indentured workers at Stenton. As part of Stenton's Inequality in Bronze Dinah Memorial Project, staff continues research into the lives of Dinah and other enslaved and indentured workers at Stenton in the 18th century. This illustrated slide talk will focus on the first generation laborers and the evidence of their lives found in historical documents and the physical structure of Stenton itself. So now I will turn it over to Laura to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Rachel, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm hoping you all can hear me. I'm situated in my office, which happens to be on the third floor of Stenton, the, the house, one of the merit rooms in which probably an indentured servant slept. And um, this is actually our first experiment to use the why in this to um, do this kind of a broadcast. So please, um, you know, your comments into the chat if you're having any trouble hearing me. Um, this might amuse some. I have a cat, Sally, our on site cat. Okay. Hear me now? I'm thinking I mean, okay. I'm going to get down to our wing. So it's going to take me just a few minutes, and I apologize for this distance on uh, our program. Thank you. <laughs>
You might have to reshare your screen if it's. Yeah, actually, it looks like it's still there. Can everyone hear me now? Great, thank you very much. So now I'm in the greenhouse um, with, with the Stanton Menagerie of Dogs and Cats and hopefully that will not um, pose any further disturbance. But thank you all for joining us today for this program um, about expanding our stories. And at Stanton for the last few years, we've actually been working very hard on a Dyna Memorial project and we're at the point in that um, process where we are in earnest, hopefully going to be um, working with a, a, a quarry and actually the stones will be being made in coming months so that we will be hopefully unveil unveiling the Dyna Memorial um, toward the end of the year. Um, but it's actually the, the recent events, recent current events, the murder of George Floyd, um, pro the protests and shifting in our world that is making this kind of work that we're doing all the more imperative um, to bring people together to understand the very real past of places like Stenton that um, very much in the 18th century up to the 1770s were dependent on both an enslaved and indentured labor force um, to make this plantation run. So without further ado, I'm going to push ahead and share with you some of our more recent research and findings through the archives, um, mostly in James Logan's ledgers in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So this slide actually is a, a, it contains a quote that comes from um, the mid 19th century, but it's a way of orienting to thinking about how houses as places where people live are very central to thinking about um, life and culture. So this is from Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1867. The household is a school of power. Can't see the screen? Hmm. Sure, maybe. Sure. Okay, here we go again. So um, this slide contains a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson in the mid 19th century, but helps us just to think about houses as seats of power, whether that's political power, personal power, and um, houses like Stenton that were actually built to be kind of hierarchical and um, house both family members and workers that fit into different ranks in the household. So here, house, the household is a school of power. There within the door, learn the tragic comedy of human life. Here's poverty and all the wisdom its hated necessities can teach. Here labor drudges, here affections glow. Here secrets of character are told, the guards of man, the guards of woman, the compensations which, like angels of justice, pay every debt the opium of custom, whereof all drink and many go mad. So just to put some context around Stenton, and you know, we tend to think about Stenton as being an American house, and of course it is in North America, it was completed in 1730, uh, and much of what we know about it is from 1720s ledger books I'm gonna show you um, images from today, but houses in, in England that started to spring up in the late 17th and well into the 18th century, kind of set the context for this sort of architectural form. This is Belton House in Lincolnshire, and you notice it has a pediment here in the central bay. Stenton at one time had a pediment and a cupola and a balustrade or a railing across 
the um, hip of the roof. So these, this sort of type of classical house would become very common in the, in the kind of Atlantic world and colonial planters and merchants would also build these houses um, generally outside of cities. But in terms of thinking about service too, have um, a servant here actually greeting those who are arriving and presiding over this landscape and someone probably also filled that role either just inside the door or um, in the forecourt sent and we think also had a kind of fenced and walled um, courtyard in front as Belton House does. And just some other um, sites to remind you, this is really very much a type, a type of house and a type of living that was not uncommon. So you're seeing the governor's palace in Williamsburg, um, a house in Gloucestershire, England, the, the Grodin House Trevos that's up in Bucks County and Pen the recreated 1930s Pensbury Manor also in Bucks County, William Penn's house on the Delaware. So Logan had, was part of a culture and looking um, to model his house on something that was going on um, among other people who had achieved a certain station of wealth as gentlemen merchants um, through trade in the Atlantic world. And I should add that Stenton was about a 500 acre plantation in James Logan's lifetime, um, run as two tenant farms and um, a place that he moved to when he had already achieved a lot in his life in terms of status. It wasn't so much an aspirational move as um, one that confirmed that he was uh, a leading person in Pennsylvania and the Atlantic. And just to kind of share a little bit, our general approach to Stenton in a way is you, if you think about archaeology kind of literally, we actually mend artifacts that were excavated on site in 1982. And we have lots of them on display in the house um, for you to see when we open again. But we also take a kind of archaeological approach to thinking about the past. And so like these, these cups, sort of chocolate and teacups here, bits are always going to be missing. And we are always on the hunt to find those other pieces. And we're trying to put the pieces back together to create a, as whole a context and an understanding as we can. But the past is always something that um, we will never really fully know and on which we tend to um, impose parts of ourself on ourselves onto as we study it. So we always have to kind of be aware of our own biases. So I mentioned James Logan's ledger books. So we, we look for the past in the ground, like the archeological artifacts, and we look for it above ground in the archives. And this is also a kind of archeological um, investigation. You just never know which tidbits you're going to find. Um, sort of literally, sometimes it feels almost visually buried among the pages. Um, and in this case, there's a little bit of, a, probably by a later generation, maybe even Deborah Norris Logan, two generations later may have pressed this um, plant sample in one of James Logan's ledger books. But I've selected these two pages, these accounts kind of were, are quite relevant for thinking about um, the building of the house, the furnishing of the house that they were doing in the 1720s, the account of house expenses, um, but that this house is being referenced is the, the Logan's townhouse in Philadelphia where they're still primarily living until they move here um, in 1730. And then on the right is the account of my plantation. So at the same time, the activities and the things that are being um, charged to the plantation's account. And these are not two opposite pages in reality. Um, these are two totally separate accounts. But the account of my plantation house is the building of Stenton. And this page documents that the groundbreaking parts of the project began in 1723. So you can see that Logan purchased a sledge. Um, he paid George Fitzwater for digging the cellar, um, Israel Pemberton for a saw. So the, the things that were needed to get started. But importantly for thinking about the use of um, enslaved labor at Stenton, cash paid Clement Plumstead, another prominent Philadelphia merchant for the hire of his Negroes. So at this point, Logan is essentially sort of paying to hire enslaved labor that belonged to someone else, um, but crucially to dig Stenton's cellar. 
And one of the other things that we think a lot about and um, in terms of interpreting stents into the public, I think visitors are still often surprised that Quakers would be slave owners. And this is the case um, very much in the region into the 1770s when it really became imperative um, amongst the Philadelphia meeting that its members would um, manumit or free the enslaved people that they still owned. Um, so this is just a little, again, I'm actually showing you a 19th century image from one of um, Edward Hicks' Peaceful Kingdoms, but you know, thinking about Quaker tenants of mind, the light within and seeking peace on earth, and that this still was a long process even within the Quaker meeting um, to get a kind of consensus ultimately from the 1688 protest in Germantown, a document um, calling for not keeping, um, not owning other human beings up to the 1770s, almost 100 years later. And I'm showing you, um, just to give a, a little context also to this trade that was the Atlantic trade that was going on. This is the Philadelphia waterfront in the 1720s. So this is where a lot of goods are coming and going that relate to um, things that James Logan was purchasing in his ledger book. And you can see the names of many of the other prominent um, merchants and traders. One here, Jonathan Dickinson, is a little older than Logan. Logan would be executor of, of his will. Um, and Dickinson would bring a number of enslaved people to Philadelphia from the Caribbean. And this is um, actually an Irish merchant, but Logan um, apprenticed to an Irish merchant in, in Dublin as a very young man before coming to America. And um, it was a, a linen merchant, a draper. And so it gives you a sense for how he kind of started out his career in the late 17th century, trying to learn trade. The London Coffee House, 1705, again, the sense of this is very much, um, you know, a white man's world. There's a, the barmaid here is, is a woman, but that the merchant world is one of white men. And um, Old London Coffee House was, um, that opened in 1754 was also a site where auctions of enslaved people took place here in Philadelphia at the southwest corner of Front and High Streets. So it gives you a you know, feel for that scene. One of the other, um, or well, several um, other merchants would live in this house, the Slate Roof House, along with James Logan when he first arrived in Philadelphia. Um, Samuel Carpenter owned, who came from Barbados, owned this, this house. Um, Isaac Norris, who, um, whose children would intermarry with Logans, also lived in this house and came from, um, Isaac Norris came from Jamaica. So these are, are men that are, um, again, have these Caribbean connections that are part of their um, tie into a trade in enslaved people. So Jonathan Dickinson um, from Port Royal, Jamaica was shipwrecked on the Southeast coast of Florida in 1696, along with his family, including um, his enslaved Africans and other passengers and crew members. Um, and we just see in here a, a little note from him referencing um, enslaved people. And this lower um, bit is from James Logan's ledger that he bought things at Dickinson's Vendue, which would be sort of his estate sale. And it does not seem um, that I can tell that, that Logan actually purchased um, enslaved people from the estate, but it's interesting to note the, the connections there. And I should also add that um, there will be times I may use the word Negro in reference to historical documents where you can also see that that was the historic word, this racializing word for black and ensla um, enslaved African people of African descent. Um, but it's not a word that feels especially comfortable, I think, in our culture today. But these are some of the, these are the passengers and um, people who traveled with Jonathan Dickinson. And you can see his, the, um, the Negro men, Peter, London, Jack, Caesar, Kajo, a child, and the women, Hagar, Sarah, 
Bella, Susanna, Kensa, and Venus, an Indian girl, which is also interesting. It's not always clear whether the, what, what exactly that might mean. Um, and then this is Isaac Norris, whom I also mentioned, and we have his, um, a portrait of him, a 19th century version of a portrait of him here at Stenton, given the um, intermarriage of the Norris and Logan children. And he also traded in um, enslaved people. This is his almanac, which he purchased in Jamaica. That's part of Stenton's collection and on deposit at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And an interesting object that the um, that is traced to Isaac Norris is this silver plate, which is said to have arrived with um, a, a Negro gr uh, girl child who survived the 1692 earthquake at Port Royal, which actually killed most of Isaac Norris's family and ultimately drove him to move to Philadelphia. But there's, it's difficult to make out. This is in the Philadelphia History Museum collection, now part of Drexel University, and this um, history uh, is engraved on the back. And like Logan, earlier in the 17 teens, Isaac Norris would build a, a house, or a small gentleman's house in the country, Fair Hill. And you can see how that landscape is laid out, again, quite similarly to what we looked at with Belton with the forecourt cupola here, kind of visually sketched in an exaggerated way and um, balustrade. But these outbuildings, these plantation outbuildings that Stenton um, shares here, they're more in front and to, the, and to the side in relationship to the house, whereas Stenton's outbuildings are behind more like this particular greenhouse. Um, this is probably a, a carriage house and a wash house here with the well in front. I'm just giving you a, a little map orientation too for anyone who may not be local and, and this is Germantown Village in relation to the grid of early Philadelphia, Stenton, as it appears um, on, on here as Logan, and Fair Hill, the Norris House, further south. And then these, the Germantown Road into the west and the York Road, the north-south <clears throat> between Philadelphia and toward New York. I couldn't resist also just showing you, um, this is all a marriage certificate between James Logan's daughter, Sarah, and Isaac Norris's son, Isaac, which Stenton also now owns. And it's a, it's a bit faded, but it's on deposit at the Library Company of Philadelphia. So one other merchant that's, that shows up in um, Isaac Norris's um, almanac, um, is a man named Samuel Preston, who sort of related to the Norrises by marriage. His wife, Rachel Lloyd, was the sister of Mary Lloyd, Isaac Norris's wife. And um, recently, last fall, I had the chance to visit Preston's house, which is Bel Air um, in South Philadelphia in Passyunk, down near the Swedish Museum, if anyone's familiar with that. It's a uh, Fairmount Park site lived in by caretakers. And, um, and here's Logan's portrait by Gustavus Aselius, the original also in the Philadelphia History Museum. But the ac accounts really go into a lot of detail about um, Logan's trade and various things. Also, one of the things is sort of a whole other topic. He's quite um, involved in the Indian trade. And so there are many records for trade goods that would ultimately be traded to to Native Americans is another way that he um, earned quite a lot of money and um, was able to negotiate with Native Americans. <clears throat> but um, Gibbons and Allen of Charleston, South Carolina are merchants that he had some dealings with in terms of um, purchasing enslaved people. So here we see um, to the account of Negroes, which is also referenced below, for Jack, and it shows the, um, the payment to Gibbons and Allen for purchase of Jack, who's also mentioned later as a Negro boy, um, cash paid for Negro boy Jack, and a Negro girl, Araminia, Armina, account of stock for Annabel, 
whom we also think is probably the same person as Hannibal in, in some other later documents, Mingo, Diana, and Ben, to Samuel Preston, whom I mentioned earlier, for the duty of Jack and Aramina, so that's the tax, and cash paid um, Joseph Jones of South Carolina for Jack, and he also notes in sort of later notation or John at plantation. So it would seem that despite this is in the 17, um, you know, in 1720, that Jack, if it's all the same, is the Negro boy Jack sent to Stenton, <clears throat> and then also to his brother-in-law, Brother Reed, for the duty. So you can see how um, this, this is a transaction in James Logan's account book for, um, for human beings. Here's another um, instance for Negro woman Diana, also involving um, Gibbons and Allen of South Carolina. And this is, is um, also referencing the same um, enslaved people showing how much each individual was, was worth. And you can see 30 pounds, 10 pounds, um, 50 and 30. So human beings um, were very valuable commodities at this time. Here's a reference to the Negro person called coffee. Um, and co it seems that coffee, there's a little bit of correspondence that ex it suggests that coffee was probably a very trusted um, enslaved person who was sometimes given money to go on errands or to go off and um, kind of be a go-between to, to people in the, the country. Um, but you can see throughout the accounts that there's a lot of references to various labor um, and it, it's often very much a running list like this to cash paid for spinning to Thomas Morgan for clothing two years and his wife's wages and Morgan was one of the um, tenant farmers at one point in time and so <clears throat> Logan does um, that the farmers are producing crops and, and Logan's providing their housing, but they're also um, paid wages for their work here. There's a mention of Peter Shankmeyer, which is another name that crops up multiple times. And actually in a very early um, 17 teens account book too, that there's a man named Peter Shankmeyer, who is the um, Sawyer at the Germantown mill. And a later reference to Peter Shankmeyer, my servant. And so we've wondered if Peter Shankmeyer um, may have become Logan's sort of personal servant. And he is probably um, a, a wage earning or indentured uh, white servant. And one of the reasons we've, we've wondered about whether he um, was Logan's personal servant is, is that in 1728, so two years prior to moving here, Logan fell on the ice and broke his hip. And so would it, was required, he needed to be carried around a great deal. And so having someone who's as strong as a Sawyer um, might make a lot of sense. Um, but continued reference by Henry Smith for a servant man, William Trent for a servant, servant woman bought of John Mason. And because he is not calling out these people as Negroes, I believe he's talking about um, buying someone else's indenture. William Henderson at my plantation, this is also one of his um, tenant farmers, and Daniel Henderson at my plantation. And here's a whole account devoted just to Peter Schenkmeyer um, which includes Cash Lent Mingo, who is one of the enslaved people. So it's just um, interesting um, where you find these little tidbits in the record. And I should just add that there's, um, it, it just requires a lot of patience to go in and find these just small references, but it's bringing these people that have been um, heretofore kind of unknown and unrealized in the interpretation at Stenton and giving them a level of individual identity. Here's that reference to Peter Shankmeyer, my servant. And so one of the other things is trying to picture what um, daily life looked like here at Stenton and who did what. And very often we don't, we don't have this 
list like some um, kinds of accounts might produce where we would know um, exactly who did what. We have like certain names like um, <clears throat> from Logan's um, will, we know there was a housekeeper at the time that he died named Phoebe Dickinson, whom we assume is a, probably again a paid, um, paid woman, paid servant. But we um, often have to sort of make just good guesses about who may have done what and what people were wearing and in what contexts. Um, there's quite a lot of um, Osnaberg, as it was known in the time, this coarse, unble coarse unbleached linen that's mentioned in the accounts and, and also supplied sometimes to tenant farmers and seems that that was probably um, this coarse, rather coarse cloth that a lot of the workers would have been using in their clothing and wearing in their clothing here. Um, but there are two men um, for whom there are trimming for clothes for Patrick Boyd, who is an indentured servant, um, and another named Daniel England. So you, you get a sense for um, trimming on coats. And this, this coat here does not have um, kind of heavy braid or, or trim, but a sense that some of the um, servants, be they enslaved or indentured, but here too probably indentured men were wearing um, specifically trimmed coats. And so we've speculated, could that be um, to be on the coach, kind of riding back and forth to Philadelphia periodically? Or would it have been, would these men have been the ones serving food in the parlor for their best dining when all the silver was on display and all the porcelain was being used at the tables? Um, do these men's coats become sort of part of the display of kind of wealth of the family? Um, but then they're just more everyday kinds of clothing purchases, a pair of shoes for Hannibal. Um, so you can really, you can still find these little bits and pieces or reference to a Palatine servant man who paid Jane the spinner and wondering exactly how all of this structure of labor was entirely completed and where. Um, but this presentation also is going to just spend a little time talking about several incidences of rebellious behavior, essentially. Um, but servants, both indentured and enslaved servants, kind of taking on their own action and not standing for what was essentially a harsh institution that they'd been purchased into. And so here um, is a letter dated 1723, um, again to the South Carolina merchants, Gibbons and Allen, related to, um, he just describes it as a Negro boy of mine, um, but, we, but it seems to be Jack. When I at present take the liberty to consign to you a Negro boy of mine, of whom I, and it's a little hard to read, but he's of good service, being both able and willing to work, but that his manhood rousing upon him, he has happened unluckily to direct his inclination to the wrong color and servants at the plantation where he lived. Being generally of the fairer sort, his company was no longer tolerable there, nor did I think fit to keep him anywhere in the province. So he's banishing him to um, the American South, essentially. But he has good things also to say about um, Jack's skills. He says the lad really deserves a good price, being strong and ambitious in other respects, besides the, what I say above, um, to do the work of a man, the same humor has also led him into some knowledge of his letters, so that he um, maybe is able to actually read, which is a very useful skill as well and interesting to note. Um, so it's, it's in this letter we see Logan um, having an idea in his own mind of the structure and what what he um, how he wants people to fit into categories in his plantation and someone has gone against that and he is sending banishing this person and I'm sorry this is such a dark slide um, but another an, an indentured servant, Patrick Boyd, one of the men who had a trimmed coat, um, 
was sold to Western Pennsylvania to the Indian trader James Latorte because he ran away and um, found himself in the Frankfurt jail, which cost Logan quite a bit of money to sustain him there for about a month. And so again, he is um, not wanting to have someone around on the plantation that he views as um, challenging the, the behavioral structure of the hierarchy at Stenton. Um, and then a third case, and I'm going to show you sort of printed um, notes related to this from the, the minutes of the Provincial Council. So this was published in the 19th century, um, but of an um, enslaved man named Samson describes that um, he willfully set on fire a dwelling house in the township of Bristol within the county of Philadelphia. And it was one of James Logan's properties. And we do believe it's the Stenton plantation somewhere. We're not quite sure where this building would have been um, amongst the 500 acres, um, but that it, it happened here. Part of Stenton is in, in Bristol Township. So that it um, continues to describe that um, Samson was arrested and there was a lot of coverage in the Pennsylvania Gazette while he was in jail. This was a, a very well-known um, case. And James Logan, in fact, was the judge sitting on the court too when this, when this happened. Um, so that again, very um, challenging inequality in the power structure So what they they put the the case off for for six months, um, and ultimately Samson was um, set to be um, killed for his crime. And a lot of people in the public were um, advocating for him that this just isn't isn't a fair punishment. And so ultimately, um, Samson was also essentially banished. He was sent outside of the British Empire and its confines. And I wanted to just take a few moments to talk about um, these two tables that are, or tables, I should say, printed tables, um, that come from Stenton's Historic Structures Report. This was a big document and a really tremendous study of the house grounded in physical examination and um, archival research from the early 1980s and came together in 1982. And for a long time, we have relied on um, this list of um, indentured servants, enslaved people, servants, and who the tenant farmers were, and had not gone back to the sources to, to verify some of these things. And you can see that the authors um, looked at many of the same sources that I just showed you. The J JLL is the James Logan Ledger. JLAB is the James Logan account book. Um, and so there, this is James Logan's will. I mentioned Phoebe Dickinson. But they leave off the names of all of the, for the, for the James and Sarah Logan generation, all of the enslaved people who were in the ledger that they, they looked at um, and only have captured Diana and Mina, Mina, who was also in um, one of the wills. So we've wondered how could someone have missed a whole clearly labeled account and neglected those names and whether um, they've been intentionally left out of the record until we took the, this research time to go back um, or not. But this really shifts our sense of, of the numbers of enslaved people who are here at Stenton and helps us to bolster interpreting and telling these stories. I have just a series of images that um, also help us to just keep in mind what life may have looked like at the time. And this is the same port, um, painter as the man, Gustavus Vesalius who painted James Logan. This is a painting in the Baltimore Museum of Art. So it's, it's the artist's own son and servant as it's labeled at the time. An image of a servant girl asleep. 
and another servant girl. And some of the images that come much more out of the kind of British Empire, but also help us to think about the ways that um, servants and enslaved people are depicted and the roles that they're, the subservient roles in which they are depicted. These are South American um, people of African descent. This woman is also from um, South America, but of mixed race descent and the implications for thinking again about plantation owners and um, enslaved people. And a series of outbuildings where um, some of the some of our outbuildings remain at Stenton, but there probably were um, additional ones we don't know about. And here's um, the kinds of things: labor in the garden. This these are this is an English garden, but giving you a sense for um, the intense work it was to maintain formal aspects of a landscape around a house like this. Serving beverages would have been an important part of of daily service work. And life in the attic. And um, I started out trying to present from my office, which is in the Stenton attic, but it the, the room in, in which I work is a garret room with also a, a kind of low ceiling and a dormer um, underneath the hipped roof with a small fireplace. And you get sort of the sense for um, how sleeping in the corner might have taken place. This is a Hogarth view um, from the mid 18th century. I, of, of the, the poet is in the window. But this is a, a, um, a historic American building survey drawing of the Garrett spaces at Stenton. And we've begun to open up. We had this, this all these rooms as collection storage and la until last year, um, this one was, was quite full of a lot of weaving and spinning equipment and is now um, an exhibition about um, Dinah and her story and slavery and in Pennsylvania. And you can come and see that when we hopefully open again before too many weeks or months. Um, and this space back here is the one that would have been my office. So there are two heated rooms. These rooms were always painted. They have the heat of fireplaces, cupboards. This room, this central room is unheated, but interestingly can be accessed through the main large staircase but also from the service staircase and had no cupboards. There's a big cupboard in the hall here with pegs for clothes. And we've wondered whether this is actually a room where enslaved servants um, slept. And then in the night, they could, could access other parts of the house without having to go through rooms. And that that's why this room may be designed this way. But there's this strong hierarchy at Stenton of um, of spaces in terms of the comfort of these larger rooms with heat and then having unheated sleeping quarters as well. But all in the garret, all in close proximity um, and not, in, not necessarily in outside separate quarters. And here again, we have um, an image of kind of on a ceramic, but on which people would have taken tea, a scene of tea taking with a servant and um, probably an enslaved servant bringing hot water. And here, um, a woman servant also pouring at the kettle and a woman bringing tea and chocolate. Some of Hogarth's depictions of his own servants. So, so that you can, we can look to paintings, European and English paintings for a sense of the kind of daily life and the work that was taking place here. Um, imagine this maybe as instead of this woman and um, maybe Phoebe Dickinson or um, an enslaved cook here in the kitchen at Stenton. And this is a 19th century image, um, but giving you a sense again of that daily life overseeing the hearth. And hard tasks like laundry chores. Um, and much of this kind of work in the first generation took place in a partially excavated area of the site that was what we believe is the original kitchen and wash house. And we'll be looking at that on um, tours in July. We're doing Facebook Live tours um, in the next couple of weeks. 
And then the cellar was also a place where a lot of heavy work would take place. And this one labeled root cellar is actually a, a beverage cellar, but the Stenton cellar has a dairy um, storage for wine bottles, glassware storage, and um, other food and supplies. So there was a lot of hauling involved in the daily life of running Stenton as a house. And that's not a very clear image, but you can see that beverage cellar and cross section and a reproduced one in the governor's palace um, in Colonial Williamsburg based on Stenton's with its barrels set up on their signs. And the kind of constant serving of beverages and again, taking things up and down um, from the cellar. The dairy where um, milk would be set to um, have the cream rise. And we know Stenton's dairy also had a kind of a trench like you see here with the flowing water and these pans of milk staying cool. And there's one of our archeological milk pans and servants at work churning and making butter and cheese. And that is this um, excavated area, partially excavated area where the original kitchen um, included the wellhead that still stands. We have other sort of little architectural ghosts around the site of daily servant life. And this is the door, it no longer um, operates, but into the back dining room where um, seats would have notched into the wall. This would be, imagine a, a board for a back and a board for a seat where probably both enslaved and indentured servants would wait to be called either into the house or into the kitchen. And the, the extant um, kitchen and wash house complex that may date to the 1780s or parts of it may in the, um, this front area may in fact be a bit earlier, but all connected by piazzas or porches that facilitate this service work and movement. And get a sense for um, that kitchen wash house, which also had um, a garret kind of quarter above and probably cooks and kitchen maids and people who actually worked in the kitchen um, were most likely to sleep there with their families. We know William Logan installed a bell system, so that's James Logan's son in the 1750s, and one of those bells is still on the back of the house. And I thought I had one more slide, but I, I seem to have finished my slides. So that is what I, I wanted to give you a sense for some of the physical spaces, um, as well as the documents that we're using as we continue to look toward um, a whole, not a whole scale reinterpretation of Stenton, but one that shifts our emphasis so that the stories of enslaved and indentured workers are all the more prominent and um, make it very clear that um, gentility and slavery and servitude are institutions that um, sit by side by side in the 18th century and that that gentility really could not survive without in slavery in the slavery of the time and um, yes so I thank you all for tuning in to this webinar, despite our um, difficult start with the Wi-Fi in my office, and um, I'm happy to to take any questions. So, Laura, we have a few questions that came in through the Q and A. Okay. Um, the first one, back to some of the earlier documents, were they recording in pounds? What was the monetary? Pounds. Yes, pounds, shillings, and pence. And can you describe what a sawyer is? Someone who um, saws with a, you know, in the, in the sawmill in a, where they're producing boards, they're taking trees and cutting them down into usable elements of wood for building. And do you know who the authors of the HSR in the early 80s were? I do. It's um, Reed Angle and um, I'm, I'm having a blank on the second, but he's pri the primary author, Reed Engel. And then in the chat, um, has Stenton been able to trace other outbuildings, dwellings, farms? 
There is, um, we have some photographs in our archives of a place called, uh, at least in the 19th century when it was photographed, these photographs were labeled as Sammy, Sammy Gentle's Farm. And it's not entirely clear to us precisely where that was, but it seems to be a kind of early farmhouse on the Stenton landscape uh, that doesn't exist anymore, um, but may well have been one of the tenant farm houses. There's also um, a Logan house in Hunting Park that's from the late 18th century, built by James Logan's grandson, George. Um, that it's, it's kind of exactly a little unclear to me precisely how that related to Stenton, but it does seem that George would have um, owned that part of the land that's Hunting Park now. Was Mary Lloyd related to the Lloyd family in Maryland? I believe the answer is yes, but I'm not clear on the genealogical connection exactly. Someone asked, what are the sources for the images of the servants? Were any of them made in Pennsylvania specifically? The only one that might have been is that Gustavus Cecilius um, painting of his son and a servant girl, and I'm not sure that it was made in Pennsylvania. He certainly was in Pennsylvania, but I don't know enough about his personal biography to know if how, high, high, how likely that is. Most of those images of, of servants are, are English. Is there any evidence to help us know whether the Logans taught the enslaved people to read and write? Um, the main one would be that letter to um, the merchants Gibbons and Allen in, in Charleston about um, Jack, that it says he has some knowledge of his letters and whether or not that's because James Logan was teaching him, I'm not sure. Um, but someone like Logan, so if you, um, he's a book collector and a, and a voracious reader and he, he needs people who can, because he's crippled, he needs people who can bring him books um, at a minimum and um, so having servants who can read is, is very useful to him. Um, so it doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me, particularly because Jack is young and referred to as a Negro boy, um, whether Logan was actually teaching him, but I, I have no real record of that. Can you share the source of the Beale drawings? Yeah, I would have to go back and look it up. Um, it comes from a book that uh, I have at home that's a, about it portraiture of specifically of um, and of servants servant life, but I could I could do that if someone wants to um, leave their email address in the chat or email me through our website. I'd be happy to do that. And have you been able to connect the enslaved into family groups? Um, for the second generation, which I didn't talk about today, actually Diana's family, we've learned about and um, we know she had a husband, we don't know his name. We know she had a daughter named Bess and we know she had a grandson named Cyrus. So that's a, a family group that came here um, because of inheritance. We know that um, William Logan's wife, or sorry, yes, William Logan's wife, Hannah Emlyn, um, and he had Hannah as part of her dowry property and that that sorry had Dinah right Hannah owned Dinah excuse me and that she came to Stenton at that time and the husband was purchased later um, but as far as those er, that early generation the names are mentioned um, and the, the someone else who might be listening might be able to chime in a little more in the chat about some of this, I don't know. But the things that I've read about um, sort of purchasing of enslaved people in the 1720s, that what's mentioned in that account of Negroes, where actually I'm showing you sort of just a detail, but where um, there's a, gr a group purchased at once, and that sounds fairly typical, and it was often referred to as a parcel of people, and it might include a man and a woman and two children. So whether those 
people actually are a family group, I, I really can't say. I just don't have any basis on which to comment, but someone else might. Oh, I'm just having my brain is turned on again. John Dickey is the other author of our Stenton Historic Structures Report. John Dickey's architectural firm did it and Reed Engel was his primary investigator and did the writing. So it doesn't look like anything more is coming in. Do you see anything, Rachel? Am I? Nope. Um, oh. oh, was there an explanation of why some were left out of the HSR? No, no. I mean, for, for, for a decade, I relied on that HSR like it was the Bible in terms of, um, you know, I couldn't believe when it, when I, really put two and two together and, and thought they did not include those names in there. Some of the most obvious names in the ledger because they're listed in this account of Negroes. Um, how could they miss that? I don't, I don't have a good answer and there's no explanation. Someone asked, could you tell us a little bit more about Dinah? Yeah, so we have on our website um, a whole Dyna page related to the project, and there's um, a PowerPoint there too, which maybe we'll also do another live program like this where we record that so that we have voice to go with it. Um, but it's pretty well captioned um, if you want to check it out, and that's um, stenton.org slash Dyna. Um, but, but a little bit about her. So as I mentioned, she, um, she was Hannah M. Lynn Logan's dowry property. So after James Logan died and um, in 1751 and William officially took, he had already started to help run Stenton as his father had strokes and got old toward the end of his life. Um, but as William officially took on um, Stenton as one of his residences, then this there, Hannah and William's enslaved people clearly came to be here with them and probably also went back and forth to Philadelphia with them, although we don't entirely know. Um, and what's this, there's a document that you would find in that PowerPoint from um, 1757 that is um, William and Hannah's purchase of Dinah's husband, who, who does not have a name that we've yet found. Um, so he must have stayed at the Emlyn estate. It's, I think at the document, one of the documents says that after George Emlyn died, that's Hannah's father, he was sold to another plantation. Um, and ultimately he became ill or too infirm to work. And um, so his owner wanted to sell him or, um, you know, sort of not keep him any longer. And so um, Dinah, he and Dinah pleaded with the Logans to purchase him so that they could be together here. And it says, this document says, in fact, that that was his choosing, that that was what he, want, he wanted to be purchased. And the documents created because by that point in time, um, actually purchasing an enslaved person by a Quaker is, is just not tolerated anymore. So it warrants this investigation by two members of the meeting who come and interview William and Hannah and presumably ask them lots of questions. And then this, this document is, is essentially explaining that they did this humane thing in purchasing this person who was too infirm to work um, and giving him a home. Um, and I'm more than paraphrasing that, but that's kind of the, the gist of the story. Um, and we don't, we know that um, Bess, the daughter was already, the quote is already free in um, William, M., William Logan's will in 1772. So we're not really sure what the circumstances were around that. Um, and then in 1776, Dinah is manumitted by William and Hannah in the spring. And then Cyrus, um, there's a manumission document for him at the end of 1776 and 1776 in December. Um, 
but it says un that he has to stay until he's of the age of 21 and it's unclear how old he is. Um, and so we've wondered whether, Di we know Dinah stays on at Stenton as a paid servant. We have proof of her wages um, until her death in 1805. And we wonder in part, does she stay or at least initially stay here? The American Revolution is underway um, and her grandson may be still here and she's possibly choosing to kind of be here to look after him until he would also be free. Um, and some, some of that's a bit unclear, but that's kind of a, a bit of her story in a, in a nutshell. We did recently find a note in um, one of Deborah Norris Logan's almanacs that states that she's buried here at Stenton um, in the garden. And it's probably Deborah Logan's garden was out to the east of the house. And it's, it could either be within the fence that's if for those of you listening who know the site it could could be quite close to the house it could also still be kind of out in what's part of Stenton Park. And is there a way for people to contact you if they have further questions after this? Yes so um, my email address is laura.kime and my name spelling is there on the screen right now laura.kime at Stenton dot org and you can also find it in our webs if you go into the Stanton website there's a staff people contact and it's listed there too all right I think those are all of the questions okay All right, well, again, thank you all. And if questions continue to arise or, um, you know, please, please feel free to be in touch. And we look forward to staying connected to all of you while we're closed. And um, yes, we'll look forward to connecting again. Thank you. <laughs>